First, second, third John, and Jude. Um, of course, today we are dealing with those books. Next week we will deal with the book of Revelation, so you can you know, spend time getting ready for that. And then the week five we will have a conclusion, and then the final exam. I must apologize to you that I don't have for you, as I told you I was going to try to today, the uh, notes on what you need to know, but I will have them up by the end of the weekend. So you can, by Sunday afternoon sometime, you should be able to access the website and get those. If you are not able to access the website for some reason, then send me an email and I will uh, respond to you with that as an attachment. But we will get those up this weekend so that you've got um, still a couple weeks to, to spend with them, okay? Um, it's just too much stuff going on to get everything done on time, it seems like. So. All right. Today, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about authorship, but let me just, I'm going to talk about the first three epistles, the, the epistles of John first. The tradition is that all three of these epistles were written by John the Apostle, who is also John the Evangelist. Now, anytime you say the Evangelist, there are four evangelists in the New Testament. Those are the ones who wrote the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are referred to as Matthew the Evangelist, Mark the Evangelist, uh, Luke the Evangelist, and John the Evangelist. But, of course, Matthew and John were also apostles. So sometimes you will hear, hear them referred to as the Apostle Matthew or the Apostle John. But whenever you hear the Evangelist, it means one of those four who wrote a gospel. The traditional belief, um, well, I'll get into authorship in just a second. Let me, let me talk about this. This is a, an icon of John. Um, you'll notice that anytime you've got one of the evangelists, one of the gospel writers, they will always be shown holding a, holding a book, usually a book that's open. Um, different, last, when we talked about First and Second Peter, we talked about the fact that Peter's always shown with keys, because of the passage in Matthew that I will give you the keys to the kingdom and, you know, whatever you bind on in earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So all of the different um, representatives, all of the different major biblical characters have certain symbols. With the evangelists, again, I'm going, I'm going back a little bit when we talked about the Gospels, each of the evangelists has an additional symbol. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each have a symbol. John's is a lion. If you ever go into a Catholic church somewhere, especially in Europe, and you see a, um, a man, an eagle, a bull, and a lion all sort of together, those are the symbols of the four evangelists. Matthew is always represented as a man. Mark is um, a eagle, Luke is a bull, and uh, John is always a lion. Okay, so that gives you some symbolism. You've probably seen those if you visit any cathedrals. Uh, again, especially in Europe, you've seen those that symbolism, and a lot of people don't know what that is. So this is an icon of John, and this is a photograph, a little blurry, unfortunately, because I had to blow it up and put it on here. This is the Basilica of St. John, or what's left of it, in Ephesus. John was, uh, for most, the last long section of his life, probably half his life, lived in Ephesus. Uh, Paul, of course, had been to Ephesus. Timothy, who Paul wrote letters to, became the bishop of Ephesus, but because he was an apostle, and uh, he was also, besides being John the Apostle, Evangelist and John the Apostle, he's also called John the Elder. Some liberal scholars have said that John the Elder is a different person, but we don't think so. Um, he was sort of the, the, he was the last living apostle. He lived in Ephesus, and it's believed that uh, in Ephesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus, went with him. You will remember that on the cross, Jesus, John was the only apostle who was there, and Mary was at the foot of the cross. Jesus said to those two, Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. In other words, he gave them to each other to care for each other. Because John was only probably 15 or 16 years old, very quite young at that point. John lived longer than any of the other apostles. He lived uh, easily into his 90s. And the tradition is that he, when he moved to Ephesus, he took Mary with him. In fact, you can visit the traditional home of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Ephesus. And this is the Basilica of St. John. This square right here with the four pillars on it is the traditional location of uh, John's grave. That is where he's supposed to be buried. And there are plaques on it and everything. 
Um, we have no reason to doubt that that's true, but we also have no absolute evidence of it. It's not like they've dug him up and done DNA testing or anything like that. But you'll notice that it is a ruin now. Almost all of the churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, which were the great churches of the early church, the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And two years ago, Carolyn and I, um, and the Hansons, um, if you know Linda Dean Hanson from, from our church, we went on a trip with Earl Palmer, our old pastor, and John and, and uh, Susan Yates from Falls Creek Church in Virginia, and visited six of the seven uh, churches that are mentioned, or locations of six of the seven churches mentioned in the book of Ephesus, in the book of Revelation. One of them is Ephesus. The only one we didn't did visit was Thyatira, which because there's apparently nothing there. All the others have at least ruins. And in Ephesus, which is one of those churches, this is the ruin. This was the church, Basilica, it was a large church in a Greek style. They actually have a model of what the church would have looked like under glass there, but uh, all those churches are gone. You know, the, they have, they're only ruins. There are no great churches like that anymore in Asia Minor, of course. It is 99% Muslim now. Uh, although it's a secular Muslim state, it's not radically Islamic, but um, this is, as I say, where John is traditionally thought to be buried. Now, we believe, let's talk about the, um, the authorship. The traditional view is that John the Evangelist, who is John the Apostle, was the author of the Gospel of John, of all three of the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and of the book of Revelation. Um, now, more modern traditions, more modern scholars have begun to question whether he wrote all of those. Some of them don't think that John wrote any of them. Um, this really came in the 19th century with higher criticism. The idea that John, um, they started thinking that Revelation was written by John of Patmos, the island of Patmos, which is where the book was written, and that that John was different that the John the Elder, who is the writer of the three uh, epistles, was a different John than John the Apostle, who wrote the uh, Gospel. But again, traditional view is that all of those things, um, all of these were written by John, who was the beloved disciple, the beloved Apostle of Jesus. Now, the, uh, the epistles, have more, at various times, had difficulty being accepted. And uh, even in the early church, this isn't just a modern liberal kind of idea. Even in the second century, Papias and Eusebius are two characters who suggested that maybe John the Apostle did not write the epistles, but that, that John the Elder was a different person. So this isn't just a modern thing. But there's a reason why um, some of the early Gnostic influences, and you all know about Gnosticism, how much do you need to tell me about that? I tell you about that. Gnosticism was an early Greek philosophy. Gnosis, the Greek word, means knowledge. The Gnostic belief system was sort of a philosophy that believed that the, the key was secret knowledge. The key to life was secret knowledge. Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. And some of what they believed was that the physical body was bad. That anything physical was bad. This is an Asian idea, it's also a Greek idea. And that only the spiritual was good. And so one of the things of the Gnostic religion was that they, um, they became, they're developed a Gnostic Christianity and the Gnostic Christians would say, Jesus did not really appear in a real physical body. That it was only a, a, a he only appeared to be, but he wasn't actually. Because Jesus, if he was, you know, the Messiah or whatever, would not have appeared in a physical body because physical is bad. But because he wasn't a physical body, he didn't actually die for us. There was no atonement. There was no need for a savior. So this was a belief. Now, second and third century was when Gnosticism really, really made it big. But there's clear indication that there was an early Gnostic belief system that occurred because some of Paul's writing seems clearly to be addressed at Gnostic beliefs, against Gnostic beliefs. And some of these, um, Johannine as it's called, these letters or epistles of John are also against that. One of the reasons that some of the writings of John, like the Gospel of John, was questioned by some early church writers because it had been accepted by the Gnostic, um, the Gnostic Christians. They thought that John's writing, for instance, the, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is from the Gospel of John, the first chapter. This idea of the Word, Logos, Greek term, being uh, eternal and spiritual, they identified that as a Gnostic belief. And completely overlooked the fact that later in that same chapter it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, which is very un-Gnostic. And yet, there are some of John's writings, and again, I believe the traditional view, the Gospel, the three epistles, and the book of Revelation were all written by this John. And almost all of the early church attested to that. In fact, all of them, really all of the early church of significance. Only Papias and Eusebius spoke out against that. Um, so we, we have um, lots and lots of witness down through history from the early church on that John wrote all of these. And we believe that's true. Okay? They were all written in Greek? Yeah, everything in the New Testament is written in Greek. Um, all of it. The Old Testament was all written in Hebrew, with the exception of a few passage, a few sections that are in Aramaic, like the Book of Daniel. There's there's a, a passage in Aram almost half the Book of Daniel is written in Aramaic or Chaldean, which was the Babylonian language. Because you remember where Daniel was, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon, and so half of that book is written in Aramaic or Chaldean. It was because the Babylonian captivity, when the Israelites were, you know, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon, they were taken into captivity. They started over, for the 70 years they were in captivity or so, they, the people started speaking the local language of the Babylonians, which is Chaldean or Aramaic. That's why by the time Jesus is there, Aramaic was the common language of the street. That's what the kids had learned. You know, that, that's the, the common language. Okay, so we believe John the Apostle, who is also John the Evangelist, who is also John the Elder, as he's called in these letters, the same person and that he wrote all of these books. Now, I want to give you a quick overview of the three, and then we're going to break them down into uh, more specifics. The first epistle of John reads more like a sermon than it does a letter. Um, it's, it is written clearly to strengthen people's faith in Jesus, to help them understand why um, Jesus as the Son of God would have come to earth as a mortal, to be living in a fleshly body and would experience a fleshly death. Now again, the reason why that's a big deal, why Jesus coming to be incarnate was a big deal is because the Gnostics said that couldn't happen. If Jesus was the great teacher, they, they would not have believed he was God. But if they believed he was a spiritual being and a great teacher and all that, he would not have come in the flesh. So 1 John is written specifically to make it clear that he did come in the flesh and he did die on our behalf. So that's the theme. Now, 1 John is five chapters. It's, it's the longest by far of these. Then the second epistle of John comes along, and it's a little different. It's clearly written as a letter, unlike the sort of sermon style of John, 1 John. But 2 John is written, it's addressed to an unnamed, uh, quote, elect lady, unquote. We believe that is a metaphor for the church because it talks about... Um, the, the elect lady's children who are obedient to the faith, and the indication is that those would be uh, the members of that church. The letter, second epistle of John, warns openly about uh, false teachers and about not taking false teachers into your home. And again, you had these, these pseudo-Christians, they call themselves Christians, but they were Gnostic Christians going around teaching false doctrine. And so this is a warning and it gives instructions on how to identify those people, what you need to look out for, to keep from be falling into the trap of accepting them into your home and believing that they're correct. Then the third epistle, again, 2nd and 3rd John are both one chapter each. The third epistle is a personal letter. It's written to a man named Gaius. Gaius is identified as a dear friend to the writer, who we believe again is John. And it's warning Gaius, or telling him about a man named Diotrephes. Diotrephes is um, opposing the author, John's, uh, authority, which is quite unusual because John was known as the elder because his, his authority as the last living apostle was universally accepted almost. But apparently this guy Diotrephes did not accept John's authority and had created sort of his own little sect and he was... Um, excommunicating from his church anybody who would take these missionaries that John sent out into their homes and take care of them. So John is writing to Gaius to warn him about Diotrephes and also to ask Gaius if he 
would accept these traveling missionaries that John was sending out into his home when they came to visit. And he had sent this letter by a third character that's mentioned, Demetrius, who is um, kindly thought of by everyone. So those are the three letters. Sort of a sermon, initially, dealing with uh, false teachers. Then a letter that refers to the elect lady, which we believe is a metaphor for the church. And then finally, a personal letter to Gaius. We'll talk about each of those individually as we go along. But that gives you kind of a, here's where we're going with this thing. So let's look at the uh, book of 1 John. We believe the author is John the Apostle, the Evangelist, the Elder, all the same person. I think I mentioned to you all once before, um, people question this stuff. I was, when I did Dave Netherton's, David Netherton's uh, memorial service in Chapala, I quoted from the book of Revelation and I said, you know, the book of Revelation from John the Apostle. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, surely you don't believe that John wrote the book of Revelation, John the Apostle. And I said, yes, I do. In fact, everybody did until about 100 years ago, and more and more people are coming back to that belief now. So there are questions about that. And Elaine Pagel is wrong. And um, she doesn't even defend herself. She no, just she makes a blanket statement. And in fact, she, Elaine Pagel is a, a woman theologian. We've mentioned her before. Um, and I think she is a Gnostic. I mean, her, her area of expertise is Gnostic, ancient Gnosticism. But I think she is a Gnostic herself. Uh, so anyway. Um, so, John the Apostle. Now, in terms of dating, because John wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation, and we believe all of them were written quite late compared to, like, Paul's letters, which were written in the 50s and 60s, the, the other Gospels, which were written probably 60s, 70s, um, we, ge we generally believe that the Gospel of John was probably, and you'll see differences in this. I mean, the difference, scholars disagree. But the traditional view is that the Gospel of John was written sometime 80 to 85 or so. Then came the three epistles of John, which were written between 85 to 90 or maybe 95. And then toward the end of that same period, John was exiled to Patmos and he wrote the book of Revelation on Patmos. And then later was released from imprisonment on Patmos, came back to Ephesus and was there at the end of his life. So. We believe that these three epistles, written after the Gospel of John, were written sometime 85 to 95 in that range. So these three books are some of the latest ones in our New Testament, all of the writings of John. The reason why, uh, and one of the reasons that we believe the dating is such as it is, one, because John lived so long and he was still active, and he was well into his 80s, even 90s. Um, the reason why the Gospel of John is so different then the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means same seeing. They're very similar. Now, they're both, they're, all three of those are kind of historical. They take the same approach. They report mostly the same things. John comes along and is completely different. He does not deal with what happened nearly as much as he deals with what it means. John's Gospel is a very theological uh, book. It explains the theology of what Jesus was all about. So the reason I believe, a lot of, a lot of scholars believe, that the, the Gospel of John is so different is the other three Gospels had already been written quite some time before. John is the only apostle left alive, and so we get to that time, in period, that, uh, time period, and John has access to the other three Gospels. He sees no reason to write a fourth one that does exactly the same thing. Instead, he does what he's being asked to do. You guys need to try to show up on time, okay? Because you just missed one third of the class almost. Uh, one third of the first hour. So, there I said it. <laughs> um, the, the idea is that probably people were saying, can you help us understand this? I mean, what, not, not just what happened, but what does it mean? And so John's Gospel, written later, doesn't cover the same historical ground. It instead is a theolo more of a theological book that explains why and what it's all about, that kind of thing, okay? So, the theme is fellowship with God, the practice of righteous living and love, how, it, how we are supposed to live as Christians. The purpose is a specifically to oppose Gnostic heresies that were common in the early church. Now, you will hear people um, who will say that, no, this is not against Gnosticism, and that Paul wasn't against Gnosticism. 
because most other historical evidences for Gnosticism occur late in the second century, or mid to late in the second century, or the third century. That's when Gnosticism really was established. But clearly, I mean, this is evidence. The letters of John, the letters of Paul, where he talks about what's clearly Gnostic ideas, are a suggestion that there was at least a proto-Gnosticism, which means an early Gnosticism, the first kind of Gnosticism, occurring during the first century, when, you know, when Paul was alive, when John was alive. Uh, you can, one way you can break this up, and there are multiple ways, the five, the five chapters you can say, the first one is the basis of fellowship, which is in Christ, and then the behavior of fellowship, which is if we have a consistent Christology, we accept Jesus Christ and his salvation as being truly God incarnate, that he really did take on the flesh, if we believe that is the basis of our fellowship, then how do we act? That's the behavior part, part of it. And it's fairly evenly split, split between those uh, the five chapters on those two sections. Okay? Um, So, here's a couple of key verses that we could take from 1 first um, first John. 1 first John 1, 3, and 4 says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you, may, you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Remember, we just said that what's the basis of our fellowship? It is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is for us. And our fellowship is because we share that. We write this to make our joy complete. This is a statement of what the book is about. Um, we proclaim this. Remember, John actually knew Jesus. He saw him. He traveled with him. He was taught by him. They camped out together. And so John is able to say, we've seen it, we heard it, and you've accepted it too, and that's the basis on which we have fellowship. And we're writing this to make your joy complete, to affirm you, to re reaffirm for you that what you believe is true. And then 1 John 5, again, the first half of the book is the basis for our fellowship. And the second half, which also is a statement of what the purpose is, uh, has to do much more with the behavior. How do we act then? Uh, 1 John 5, 11 to 13 says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who does not have the Son, uh, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you. Uh, you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The assurance of that. That you can live in that assurance. Alright? Um, so these are two of the primary verses, I think, that tell us about... Um, tell us what 1 John is all about. Um, let's look now at an outline of this book. When we get to 2 John and 3 John and Jude, I'm actually going to read them because I give you do so in a few minutes. Yes. As for why does he say, we proclaim, and then we write, who is we? Well, he's speaking on behalf of the church. You know, um, when he says we. It's also true that, that Hebrew writing, you'll notice that this book doesn't, there's no attributions in this book. It doesn't say, I, John, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul was very unusual in that regard. Most Jewish writers would never have put their name on something because that would have been considered. Well, for instance, in the Gospel of John, John never names himself. He says, uh, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, or the beloved disciple. That's considered an appropriate humility for that time. And so John, if he said, I then that would have been claimed, you know, that would have seemed pretentious in those days. And so he says we because it's, it's, both, it's both considered more, more uh, you know, a sign of humility, but it also is that he's speaking on behalf of the church. It's not just him. It's all of the believers in Jesus Christ that would maintain this. Thank you. Okay? Um, now, I, I mentioned, I do want to say one thing. I mentioned that Modern scholars tend to think that John did not write these letters. And I want to give you an example of the kind of argument they make. The people who argue against John being the author, even though the vocabulary, the phraseology, the themes, for instance, I think I had something here. Um, 
the, the um, well, the, the themes that we find in the gospel, things like light and life and uh, a lot of different things that are significantly the same between the gospel and between these letters. Vocabulary is similar, everything seems similar, but here's what the, the liberal scholars say causes them to believe that John did not write these. They would say that this epistle, the epistles, often use a demonstrative pronoun at the beginning of a sentence, and then a particle or conjunction followed by an explanation or definition of the demonstrative at the end of the sentence, and that's not consistent with the way, with the writing in the gospel. Now that's a very fine, detailed thing. The assumption that because that's a stylistic thing that's used in these letters, it would always be used, even though the vocabulary is the same, the themes are the same, everything else is the same, they also say that the author of these epistles uses a conditional sentence in a variety of rhetorical figures that are unknown to the gospel. That's the only reason that liberal scholars argue that this is not written by John. And most scholars today have gone back to the traditional view and said that is not nearly enough reason to believe that this, was, this stuff is not written by John. There's, there's 50 times more evidence, linguistically, stylistically, thematically, that these are written by the same people. Okay? Um, so let's look now at an outline of 1 John. It starts with a basic introduction which establishes the reality of the Incarnation. Remember, John is writing against people, the Gnostics, who would claim that Jesus was not actually in a physical body. That it only looked like it. It only appeared to be. It was a, it was a mirage. Now, the the theology of that is called docetism. It comes from a Greek word which means an appearance. Docetism is the old heresy that Jesus wasn't really incarnated in a physical body. He just looked like it. Okay. So docetism was one of the characteristics. It was one of the one of the uh, things that was wrong with Gnosticism. Is they were they were it was a docetistic philosophy that Jesus didn't really come in the body. So right off the bat, right out of the chute, John establishes the reality, the physical reality of the Incarnation in order to speak against this docetism, the Gnostic beliefs that were common in that day. He then again gets into the, what the basis for our fellowship. He talks about the fact that Christian life is built on, is based upon fellowship both with the Father and with the Son, Jesus. That's the basis. And then he talks about ethical tests for our fellowship. He talks about the fact that if we're, there's false teachers is the theme in, in the two of these, well, in all three of these letters, actually. So he talks about what ethical tests do we have. If we all, if we Christians, all have fellowship together with one another based upon what Jesus did. We have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And because of that, we have fellowship with each other. Well, what is the nature, what is the basis of us being able to have fellowship with one another? One is a moral likeness. We have the same moral code. Now again, the Gnostics, it was, strangely enough, the Gnostics tend to go in one or two extremes. Because they didn't think the physical body was real or good or important, many of them practiced a severe asceticism. In other words, denying their body. You know, fasting to the extreme, not doing anything that's pleasurable, not you know, wearing, wearing scratchy clothes and all kinds of stuff because they were trying to deny the power that the body had to make them do things. On the other hand, some Gnostics went the opposite direction and said, since my body doesn't matter, then I can do whatever I want with it. I can have three-day orgies twice a week, I can glut myself, I can, you know, I can do all kinds of bad things to my body because that doesn't matter. So weirdly enough, Gnosticism interpreted their, the, the insignificance of the material body in opposite directions, either uh, strict asceticism or in um, libertine kind of actions, doing whatever you wanted. So a moral likeness, consistency, is one of the things. Second, a willingness to confess sin, to recognize your own sinfulness. The Gnostics didn't really believe in sin. They believed that if you, um, as long as you had the right knowledge, then you were one of the elect. It had nothing to do with confessing your sins and being forgiven of it. Were you a recipient of the right knowledge? And so they even talked about Jesus as being the great teacher, the one who taught the knowledge. Also, obedience. Are we obedient to God, to Jesus and his instructions? Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. 
And are they obedient to the people who have been put in authority over them? And finally, do they show love for fellow believers? The Gnostics apparently were, were a pretty selfish bunch. You know, they were not. They tended to say, I'm one, you know, very proud. I'm one of the elect. I'm one of those who has the special knowledge. And so get out of my way, kind of folks. So that's ethical test of, disciple, of uh, fellowship. And then he has two digressions. He goes off to some discussions. And then we have the Christological test of fellowship. So first, there's ethical tests. Here's how you have to act to demonstrate that you are in Christ and the, and the basis for our fellowship. Then there's the Christological test. What do you say about Jesus, in other words? Christological means a view of Christ. He contrasts the view of apostates with those of believers in terms of how they view Jesus. He then talks about the person of Christ, the crux of the test. I think you all have heard me say before that if, if you ever wonder if, um, if a church or a theology or a group, if they're really Christian or not, the question is, what do they say about Jesus? Right theology is based upon what do you think about Jesus? Which is why Mormonism is not Christian. Because the Mormon view of Jesus Christ is not Orthodox Christianity. Um, and so the idea of the person of Christ, that is the crux. That is the, the linchpin for whether or not a, a faith is truly Christian. And are they persistent in their belief? In other words, do they waffle? Do they change from week to week depending upon which way the wind blows? Or are they persistent and consistent in their faith? So in, in, in their view of Christ. So we have an ethical test, series of ethical tests for whether or not people can be in fellowship as Christians. And we have a Christological test. What do they say about Jesus? He then gets into discussing the Christian life as divine sonship. That we are the children of God in Jesus Christ. And so then he gets into um, the, the and here's where he gets into behavior. The first part of it really was a, you know, what's the, what's the basis for us having fellowship? Then he gets into, okay, how do we act based upon where we're going? And so first he then gets into an ethical test of sonship. How do you act? Do you show righteousness in your life, as Jesus told us to? Do you express love in your life, as Jesus told us to? These are ethical tests of whether or not we really, in terms of how we live our lives, whether we are in Christ. He goes on with that and has then Christological tests of sonship. You see here, he has ethical and Christological tests of whether there's a basis for us to have fellowship. And then he has ethical and, and Christological tests for whether or not um, we are living the life we should be living. Now remember, a lot of this has to do with false teachers. And he's giving very clear instructions for people to understand whether they're in the right place and whether other people they're listening to are in the right place. He then goes on in describing the Christian life, which integrates those ethical and Christological halves. That he has, he's, he's dealt with ethical and Christological tests, both in, as the basis for fellowship and as how we should be living our lives. The ethical test boils down to just one thing, love. He talks about what is the source of love, what is the fruit of love, meaning what comes out of it, and then the relationship of our love for God with our, our love for uh, our few low Christians, our fellow Christians. Um, that all of this comes together at the end. If we love God, we will love our fellow Christians, and we will, we will see that. So again, that's the ethical test. And then the Christological test, very simply, what do we say about Jesus? Do we accept that He was and is the Son of God who was incarnated in a physical body, who died for us, and we believe is coming again. And then he concludes with the great Christian certainties, especially the certainty that Christ will come again and that we will be with him forever. So, this five chapters, there's a huge amount in here. It has to do with what's the basis for our being Christians together, and what's the basis for how we're supposed to act in the world, and how does all that tie together, all right? Especially, how do we know if someone really is Christian, what are the tests for ourselves to make sure we're in the right place, but for others as well? Okay. Um, in addition, earlier I shared with you that Paul says in the first chapter that he's writing so that the, the, the people who's reading it, that their joy might be full. He says in the fifth chapter that they might know that they have eternal life. That's the, you know, the, the very strong Christian certainty. 
in between, in the second chapter, he talks about the fact that I'm writing this to you so that you might not practice sin. He's trying to give direction so that they'll know how, how to act and how not to act. So he's very particular about that. Um, John goes so far in 1 John as to refer to those who are teaching falsely as antichrists. He doesn't think in terms of one antichrist. He, apparently some of these teachers had been Christian teachers and been misled and are now teaching Gnostic heresy. And he refers to them as, as uh, antichrists, especially because they were teaching docetism, the idea that Jesus came to earth as a spirit but did not really have a body. Um, there was a very popular Gnostic who started around this time and then later called Serinthus. And it's believed that some of the things Paul, uh, John says in here may have been specifically oriented toward addressing the heresies of Serinthus. Uh, any questions about that? First John. I understand that uh, this epistles were written because in the church where John was, there was the great need to cover Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Gnosticism, we know it, it came even a little earlier uh, when Paul wrote Colossians. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there are real similarities with you. Yep. And uh, so Gnosticism was well spreading and taking over some churches and um, this came when the Holy Spirit used John to write these epistles to teach us that, that they are so precious and the words are so clear that yes, there is no doubt that Christ was the Son of God and we get salvation through Him and these are the tests right there. Right. Uh, 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 so it, it was true that Gnosticism was even though it was not as strong as in the second century, it was very present. Well, the, the, um, I believe that's true as well. Although, again, more liberal scholars will say, well, Gnosticism didn't really exist until the second century and then the third century. So these books, they said, would say, these books couldn't have been written by Colossians, couldn't have been written by Paul, and these epistles couldn't have been written by John. They had to be written later. Well, turn that around and say, instead of saying that, that Gnosticism came later, so these books had to be later. Maybe these books are clear evidence that, since all the other evidence is that they were written early, maybe this is clear evidence that there at least was a proto-Gnosticism that existed when Paul was writing Colossians and when John was writing the epistles. Bob? <clears throat> Thank you. I have a friend who's always saying, well, so-and-so says he's saved, but he's not really saved. And that just bugs the heck out of me. But is this giving a valid basis of justification for determining who saved and who isn't? No, it isn't. Um, the, the suggestion here is not to say that person's saved or that person's not saved. The issue is, first, look at yourself. I mean, there's a clear indication of that. Um, because John, the, the Gospel of John was written to unbelievers to tell them about Jesus. It's clearly evangelical in that regard, evangelistic in that regard. Um, the epistles of John were written to and about people who were supposedly Christians, but some of whom had fallen victim to this heresy. Now, the main concern John has here isn't, you know, I read this, and, and John's not intending for me to take this and say, you're not a Christian because you don't obey this. But rather, if you're teaching, it will make sure that I don't fall victim to false teaching. It's helping me have criteria as to whether or not I ought to listen to what somebody else is telling me. So it's not a matter of evaluating whether somebody else is saved or not. It is not our right to say whether someone else is saved. That's not whoever it is that you know that's doing that, tell them, tell them they're sinning. Because we are not called upon to make the decision whether somebody else is, is saved or not. If, if, particularly if we're in a position of leadership, if somebody is acting in a way that's inconsistent with their faith and they're claiming to be a Christian, we do have a right to say, wait a minute, you know, again, if we're in a position of leadership, I think you need to rethink that, that you know, that direction, because you're not going in a way that seems consistent with the Scripture. We can do that. We can't go so far as to say, you're not saved without ourselves sinning. That's, that's the kind of judgment we're told we're not allowed to do. Is that fair? Okay. Anything else about that? 
Um, some of the things that you read, I mentioned themes earlier. Themes that are consistent through the Gospel and the Epistles and somewhat even into Revelation, although Revelation has a very specific focus. Talking about the God who is light, that we are to live in His light, the exhortation to love, to not be of this world, uh, to have uh, godly and spiritual motives rather than earthly motives, to emphasize that we love one another rather than we love ourselves, that we are responsible to be witnesses to the God who is Himself love, the idea of life eternal, all those themes are present in the Gospel of John and they're present in the Epistles of John. And again, this is the reason why we have such strong evidence that these, this was written by the same person. We do believe that uh, these epistles were written predominantly for a Gentile audience, partly because, again, John is in Asia Minor, where there were Jewish communities pretty much everywhere, but they were very small. These letters, which are written, the reason they're called general or Catholic epistles is because they weren't written to a church or an individual like Paul's letters, but written to the entire of the Christian church, and most of them are intended to be what's called encyclical letters, meaning that they go from one church to the next, and each one reads them. So it would go to the church in Pergamum and be read, and then they would pass it on to the church in Thyatira, and they would read it, and then they would pass it on to the church in Laodicea, and they would read it. And in fact, one of the letters, uh, the third, third John, he mentions the, the courier, Demetrius, is the one who's delivering the letter, even though that letter is a, is a more personal letter to a particular person, Gaius, and in that regard it's a little bit different um, from the other general epistles. Still, these were carried by people to various locations so they could be read out, and that's, you know, that's the indication. It's also worth noting that when you read John, it doesn't read at all like Paul's writing. Paul was very well educated, and he wrote like a very well educated man. John was, was fairly simple. And his, his vocabulary is smaller. Now, one of the things that does is it gives it kind of more punch. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Paul would have taken three chapters to say that, okay? Because Paul was, you know, a very different kind of mind. Paul was much more um, like the Greeks in terms of uh, boom, 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 boom. You know, very logical, philosophical. You know, Paul's stuff is very linear. Paul starts an argument, and he then, you know, makes point after point after point along that line. Um, some of Paul's books are almost like one sentence. You know, it's like he starts something, he takes deep breath, and he starts, and he doesn't exhale until he gets done with the whole thing, because he's got a very clear structure, right? Very linear, to walk through that argument. John is not like that. John is much more Jewish typically Jewish in his presentation, his thought moves in loops and circles. He circles back around and talks about something again. Um, he, and each time he, each time he makes the circle, he gets a little bit more detail in terms of what he wants you to know. But it's not do 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 it's much more And so when you read John, John uses some uh, parallel kinds of structures that are very similar to Hebrew poetry. Those of you who were in the class in Psalms and Proverbs that we talked a little, we've been talking a lot about Hebrew poetry. How they'll use an image, and then they'll add another image to it to extend the metaphor, or they'll add a positive, have a positive image, and then counter it with a negative image for emphasis. Well, John writes like that, not like Paul, which is one point, one A, one B, one C, two A, two B, two C. Paul is, or uh, John rather, is just sort of. Very poetic, very very image heavy, um, not very legal in terms of his arguments the way Paul is. Okay, so you read John's letters or the Gospel or even Revelation, you'll get a very different feel than if you read the writings of Paul. Okay, yes. Did he have a scribe? Um, yes, John did have a scribe. In fact, we do know that the Book of Revelation, written on Patmos, that the scribe's name was. <clears throat> I don't remember what it was. Somebody look up the first chapter of Revelation and tell me. But um, we know there are even images, the, you know, paintings, icons of John dictating the book of Revelation to his scribe on, um, on Patmos. Now, we don't know if he had a scribe all the time. We do know that Paul did. And we think the reason he had a scribe all the time is probably because his eyes were so bad. There's well, that's why I asked yeah. somebody who lives to be 90 often. Yeah, and, and, and that's possible, too. I, I have the, 
the stories are told that when John was quite elderly, because he still was a primary spiritual leader for all the churches, that they would carry him from town to town on a sedan chair. You know, a chair that you sit in and like four guys pick it up and carry it someplace, like you see in the in the, uh, the Middle Ages kind of stuff. Well, they had sedan chairs back then too, and because he was old, couldn't walk that far, they would carry him from place to place. Um, okay, let's talk about now the book of Second John. Same author, John the Apostle, same time period, 85 to 95, circa 85 to 95. And here, John gets much more specific about uh, discernment of false teachers, receiving the, the true teachers, but not receiving the false teachers who are out there misleading the faithful. He again is opposing her Gnostic heresies, which were common in the early church, one way you might think about this, again, um, this is only 13 verses in 2 John. So, abide in God's commandments and don't abide in false teachers. Now, I'm going I'm to read this. 13 verses, I can read. So, um, notice the, the metaphor here for the, the elect lady. Uh, 2 John, the elder. Again, he's called John the elder. But he was the elder, the, the last living apostle, very old leader of the you know, churches. To the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Clearly a metaphor for Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, this means Christians, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. There you hear it, that he's speaking against docetism and Gnosticism. The false teachers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister who is chosen by God send their greetings. So the indication here is that uh, John is writing from one church to another church, and he uses the metaphor that the other church is the lady, or the elect lady, as it's sometimes translated, and he's writing from the church that he's where he is, and is calling that their sister. It's a sister church, in other words. So they share in that. The children are those who are members of the church, who are going out from there. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, um, Key verse, I think, here, verses are 7 to 10, since there's only 13 verses. You know, there's not. Um, Paul says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the, the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be fully re rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead does not continue the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. This is the key. That's the focus of the whole of this 13-verse book of 2 John. The outline, very simply, is greetings, commendation for, for you and your children, meaning the members of your church who understand the truth, exhortation and warnings against false doctrine and against taking people into your home, and then a conclusion and final reading. Very simple. 13 verses. Was the Roman persecution going on at that time, or had that sort of waned? Well, there, uh, the only official persecution that had occurred by this time would have been the persecution of Nero in Rome. Now, 
We know that the persecution of Christians in Rome in the 60s would have been pretty severe. This is what led to the death of both Peter and Paul, we believe. Both of them were executed because of the Neronian persecution, the persecution of Emperor Nero. However, it would be unrealistic to think that the emperor in Rome could have decided Christians were wrong and bad and been executing them and not had some of that leak out into the Roman Empire, elsewhere into the countryside. So while there was no official declaration by Nero or the early emperors, the earliest after this would be in the 110s or so. About 110 is when Pliny the Younger, who was a Roman provincial governor in the northern part of Asia Minor along the Black Sea, he had a province he was responsible for, he wrote back to the emperor Hadrian early in the second century, so that would have been 20 to 30 years after this, and said, I've got these Christians here, and uh, is, should I just arrest them because of them being Christians, or do they have to have committed some other crime? That's what made me ask the question, because it's sort of an in-between time. Well, how much, how much had happened between Nero and Hadrian and being emperor and writing to Pliny the Younger, clearly there was persecution of Christians somewhat, but we don't have a lot of detail about that at that point. And, and you need to understand, Christians were not considered important. They weren't. There wasn't a lot of them at that point. No, uh, they, they were the wealthy part they, of society. They were, not, they were not influential. There was not a whole lot of reason to pay attention to them. The only reason Nero paid attention to them is because everybody was blaming him for having burned down Rome, and he needed, he needed a scapegoat. He needed somebody else that he could blame for it. And so the Christians were not popular because they would not participate in any of the things. Almost every social activity that the Romans in Rome did involved some recognition of the Roman gods. You know, you go to you know you go to the theater, and they would start out with a you know with a public acknowledgement of the gods and, and, and request the presence of the gods at the meeting. Um, anything you did involved sacrificing the gods, acknowledging the gods, praising the gods, or something else. Well, Christians wouldn't do that, and so for the most part, they didn't participate in social events. Well, because they didn't participate in social events, people didn't like them. They thought they were better than them or whatever, and they started being accused of all sorts of inappropriate things they, they weren't guilty of. And so that's why Nero picked on them, because they were easy. Nobody liked them very much, and nobody would mind too much if they were persecuted. And by blaming them, he took the heat off himself. And, and historically, by the way, there really isn't any evidence that he burned out wrong. Um, he may have actually been innocent, at least up until the time he started setting Christians on fire to light the garden parties. So Did he play the violin? I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions then about the second epistle of John? Um, second and third letters are very similar. I mean, there's a different style. The third letter is a very personal letter. Um, the, the second one, as you just read, there's, there's some metaphors in there, but it's much more general about false teachers and not taking them in and not listening to them. Okay, um, but both are considered are, are focused on Gnosticism and particularly the Docetic heresy of Gnosticism. So let's talk about the third epistle of John. John the Apostle, and I put circa AD 90 because it was written after the first two. You know, we believe these are in, in some sequence, some order. So it still would be sometime in the 85 to 90, 95 range. We believe this was written before the, uh, the Re book of Revelation. Um, to encourage, encouragement to enjoy and continue fellowship with fellow believers, to commend worthy Christian workers and warn those who are not being loving. Now, this is very much a personal letter. It, um, because it's a personal letter and it's very brief, it was slow to be accepted as canon. But eventually, they accepted as the third of the letters in this series. And, you know, the first one was very general, longer. The second one was sent from a church to another church, talking about issues of false teachers. This one deals with a specific, uh, both a, a commendation to a Christian leader, and also a condemnation of somebody who'd been against the, the church. Now, this is written to a man named Gaius. Tradition has it, and in some early, not very early, but some, you know, like 3rd century, 4th century documents, I think it was, identified that Gaius was the name of the man who was elected the Bishop of Pergamum. Pergamum was one of those seven churches in the book of Revelation. And a fascinating place to visit, by the way. It's a, a city that was built on top of this hill overlooking this huge valley. Um, and 
and very influential in its day. So um, Gaius, again, tradition says this is the same Gaius that later records say was uh, made the Bishop of Pergamum. So it is a condemnation of Gaius and a, con a, a com commendation of Gaius and a condemnation of Diotrephes. Again, let me read it to you. It's only 14 verses, only one more than 2 John. The elder, he introduces himself the same way, John the elder, because everyone perceived him as the elder leader of the church. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continued to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. This indicates that Gaius apparently became a Christian under the ministry of John. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name, capital N, that's Jesus, that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. So he's talking about missionaries that were sent out. And Jesus had established the pattern amongst missionaries that they would go out without any, you know, Jesus told them, don't take extra sandals or a change of clothes or any money, just go, and you'll be taken care of. Well, that tradition continued, and so there needed to be Christians along the way that would take these people in and take care of them while they were out preaching and ministering the gospel. He continues in verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Di Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. Apparently Diotrephes had, was the minister had taken over this church. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. He's throwing people out of the church for welcoming these missionaries that John is sending. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. This is the same thing he said in, in uh, second John. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Okay, very short letter. Personal, and yet he's dealing with a problem, a discipline problem within the church. There's not an indication that Diotrephes, the bad guy in the scene, that he had false doctrine, he's not teaching docetism or whatever, or John would have said so, he has a problem with church authority. He thinks that he is all that matters, and so he is, he's deciding who he will listen to, even not, listen, well, not wanting to listen to the people sent by, by John, and it's, a, it's an authority issue for him. He wants to be first, and so will not welcome us, he says. Okay? Any questions about that? Let's look at a couple of what I think are the key verses here. 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. Oh, I'm sorry, 2nd, 3rd John. Oh, wait, wait. This is wrong. I, I didn't copy the verses over. Shoot. Never mind. I, what happened was I copied, you know, I copied screens over and then just filled in the blanks. So for some reason, that didn't do that. It's probably in here somewhere. <laughs> so, the whole thing is the key verses. <laughs> How's that? Um, outline. First, greetings. Greetings to Gaius. It's a personal letter, more personal than either of the other two. Um, the commendation of Gaius, that he is being true to the faith. Apparently, he came to the faith by Jesus. And there's an indication here, Gaius is probably a man of some means. Because he has welcomed the missionaries into his home, and John is encouraging him to do so again. So he apparently, John doesn't have any reluctance to ask him to take care of these guys when they're in town, so there's an indication that he probably had the capability to do so. There is then a condemnation of Diotrephes, this guy who wants to be first and so refuses to accept anyone else's authority or any missionaries that are sent out by someone else. Then an exhortation to Gaius to continue to do good, not to imitate what is evil. And the example of Demetrius, and the, the suggestion is that Demetrius might have been the courier, the one who was carrying this letter from John to uh, Gaius. 
And then the conclusion, benediction, and final greetings. Uh, peace to you. Send greetings to everyone. Uh, greet them by name. Okay. Questions about that? Do you want to take a break, or do you want to spend another 10 or 15 minutes and talk about the book of Jude? Let's talk about the book of Jude. Okay, let's push forward. Um, so when you're looking, is it, is it significant that he, and like culturally significant, that he says, uh, mentioned by name? No, he's just um, saying... He's just personalizing. Yeah, he's just personalizing to say... You know, don't just say, hey, everybody, from John. He says, go to them and say, Judy, John said to say hello. You know, Marvin, John sends his greetings. It's just, a, and, and that's not a thing you would do unless you really were, were close to God. All right? You know, he's saying, greet everybody by name. Don't just generalize. Well, you wouldn't do that if your relationship with the person you're writing to is only formal. Or if there was 4,000 people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true, too. It must have been a small group. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the book of Jude. This not written by John. Okay, don't misunderstand my including it here. It's only 25 verses. It's another one, you know, one chapter book. And so I felt like we should deal with it here rather than uh, tag it on to Revelation or something else. Um, we believe this was written quite a bit earlier, probably AD 60 to 65. Traditionally, it is written by Jude who was the brother of Jesus. Now, when he's identified in the Gospels, the, the brothers of Jesus are identified, his name is Judas. But after the betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot, it became fairly common amongst early Christians to refer to them instead as Jude, because they didn't want to, you know, in any way suggest that this was the betrayer of Christ. But Jude and Judas are the same. Now, the first chapter starts out with Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and a brother of James. We studied the book of James. The only reason why someone would say, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, would be if, James, if this is a James that everybody knows. Well, it's not James, the son of Zebedee, because we know who his brother was, and that was John. Okay, um, And it's not... James, son of Alphaeus, because we don't know anything about him. He's, he's almost anonymous, even though he's a, he was a, an apostle. The only James that Jude could be referring to here would be James, the head of the council of Jerusalem, and the brother of Jesus. Which means, in a modest way, Jude is saying here that this is one of the other brothers of Jesus, or half-brothers, if you will. One of the other children of Mary, but in this case by Joseph. Catholics would not agree with this come up with some other version because they don't believe that Mary had any other children but Jesus. We do. So we believe that this is Judas or Jude, the brother of Jesus. Now he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. That's kind of a backhanded way of saying I'm the brother of Jesus. But again, there was, there was a, a very strong tendency amongst Hebrew writers of the day not to, not to brag, not to look up at him. And so he wouldn't start it out by saying, Jude, a brother of Jesus, our Lord, because that would sound like too much. And so instead he says, I'm a servant of Jesus, a brother of James, because everybody knew that James was the brother of Jesus. And Jude was a younger brother. All right, make sense? We believe it was written around 80, 60 to 65, somewhere in there. And the theme, again, consistent with the three epistles of John, is a condemnation of false teachers and libertines. Remember I told you that the Gnostics, many of them were libertines because they believed since their body wasn't important, they could do whatever they wanted, whatever felt good. Three-day orgies twice a week, you know, eat until you pass out, drink until you can't, you know, you just can't drink anymore, whatever it was. They, they <laughs> felt like they could live that way because the body didn't matter. Mike, did you have something? Okay, I just saw your hand over here. Um, and the encouragement then to the faithful to stand strong. The purpose, to make clear that salvation does not give a license to sin. This is the same thing that James, his, Judas's brother, writes about in the epistle of James. If you are a follower of Jesus, you need to act like it. Not that acting good will get you saved, but if you're saved, you should act good. And so James 
the half-brother of Jesus, and Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, both have significantly the same theme. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you better act like it. You have a responsibility to live a righteous life as far as you can. Um, and it's an opposition to the libertine teachers, which are the Gnostic teachers, the people who are saying, whatever you do in your body doesn't matter, go for it. All right? We can think of this as having four sections. First is the purpose. Um, and the purpose reads, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you, the false teachers. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Okay, very similar to the theme in the book of James. Secondly, a description of those false teachers, what they look like, how they act. Then, a defense against the false teachers. Here's what you do about it. Here's how you need to respond. And then the doxology. And the doxology in Jude is considered one of the most beautiful and important doxologies in all of the New Testament. And I want to read that for you. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Now that's a doxology. Okay. Um, the Jude had some trouble getting accepted as part of the canon. Nobody ever doubted its authenticity that it really was written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. Um, but the reason that it had trouble is, one, it's so short. The reason probably 2nd and 3rd John got accepted is because they were seen as sort of sequels to the longer 1st John. But this is only 25 verses. It's other than 2nd and 3rd John. I think it is the shortest book in, in the New Testament. Um, and again, 2nd and 3rd John are seen as sequels. They're, you know, they're, they're part, the epistles of John are sort of seen as together. But particularly it had difficulty because Jude quotes directly from the book of Enoch, which is an apocryphal book, a book in the Apocrypha. He actually has two references. One, he cites Enoch's prophecy that the Lord would come with many thousands of his saints to render judgment on the whole world. Again, Enoch is in the book of in, in is not part of the canon. So the fact that he's quoting a book that's not part of the canon caused people to wonder whether this was should be in the canon. He also paraphrases an incident in the text of Enoch in which Satan and Michael quarrel over the body of Moses. Apparently, according to the book of Enoch, and, and uh, Jude refers to it in his letter, the devil and Michael the archangel are arguing over who gets to take the body of Moses. Now, both of those things are referred to from the book of Enoch in Jude. Because of that, there was question as to whether or not it should be Canon. It was accepted fairly early as canon in the church, but at various times people would sort of say, yeah, but that is weird, you know, that he quotes a book that is not canonical. But the, the clear indication was both because the authorship was, was accepted as being Jude, the brother of Jesus, the brother of James, the head of the Jerusalem Council, the author of the book uh, of the Epistle of James, which was readily accepted as canon, the decision was that this should be canon as well. The material in it, the content in it, it's not like he quotes something from the Book of Enoch that theologically is wrong. He quotes two things that are, you know, not inconsistent with other doctrine. One is just kind of weird. You know, the devil and Michael arguing over the body of, of Moses. But there's nothing inherently wrong with that, theologically. And so it was finally accepted that this is part of the canon. Uh, it should be part of the canon because the teaching in it is very sound and very consistent with all three of the letters of Jude and even with the writing of, the book of uh, his brother James in the epistle of James. Okay? It is kind of strange though. It clearly was intended as being an encyclical letter, one to be read around. It's not addressed to anybody in particular. It is, in fact, the address is um, 
universal. To those who have been called, it doesn't get much more universal than that when you're talking about Christians, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. So it was intended to be passed around and read. Um, the, the writing is very fluent. It is very good Greek. Um, it's, uh, again, we can say, well, you know, Jew, how educated would he have been? If he was a brother of Jesus, which means he lived in, you know, lived in Nazareth, etc., etc. Well, remember, Jesus died in the early 30 or the early 30s. Um, that means that if this was written 60 to 65, there would have been 30 or 35 years in there. And the person who wrote this undoubtedly had been in some role of leadership in the church. We don't know exactly what. But as the brother of uh, James, the head of the Jerusalem Council, he probably held a position of some importance. And as the brother of Jesus. Which means over a period of time, you actually can learn more. You can study. I believe that my written vocabulary, my written skills are a whole lot better now than they were when I was 25, you know, 32 years ago. So, yeah, I think that it's not unreasonable to believe that over a period of time, somebody whose whole job for 30 five, 30, almost 40 years, has been, well, 35 years, has been the work of the church and writing and teaching and learning, that their vocabulary would have gotten better. And most of the work that would have been done at that time would have been in Greek. So their Greek would have gotten better. Okay? Um, this time I actually do have the right verses in here. The key verses, I believe, are 3, 4, and 17, 19. So, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you, you know, he, in other words, he wanted to write a letter that was all sweetness and light, isn't it great, I'm so glad that we're brothers in the Lord, etc. But, he felt he needed to write and urge them to contend for the faith that was once up for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. There are wolves in the sheepfold. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. So he's saying, I'd like to have written you just a friendly, warm blessing letter, but instead I have to deal with a problem. You need to be aware of it. And he goes on in verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. So watch out for that. Okay? In terms of an outline, it starts out with the greetings, which I just read you, and then the reason or the occasion for the letter. He talks about the change of subject, the idea that I wanted to just write you something pleasant, but I have to deal with a problem here, and so that's why I'm writing instead. And then the presence of the godless apostates, the false teachers. There's a warning against those false teachers. He talks about the historical judgment against them, the fact that from the earliest time, it has been clear that people would do this and that they would be judged. He even gives some historical examples of judgment against these apostates, like unbelieving Israel, how they were judged by God when they strayed, how angels who, who followed Lucifer, and they fell from heaven and were judged and will be held for judgment. And the judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. Those who chose wrongly, who followed an immoral life, were judged for it. He then brings it up to date and says, uh, and describes the apostates that are in his day. He describes their slanderous speech. He describes their character in graphic terms. And he prophesies specifically their destruction. Not in general terms, but in specific terms. He then exhorts the believers to stay true to the faith and to follow the morality they've been taught, and then he concludes with the doxology, which we just read. A beautiful doxology. Any questions about that? Pardon? Just a comment back to the beginning when he said, uh, uh, do the servant of Jesus. That's the only relationship that matters. That's the relationship that would cause them to be interested in what he has to say. He right. could be the brother, he could believe, be a believer, and not a cousin of that's not important, but he's a servant, and by the way, I'm the brother of John, uh, uh, James, James yeah. uh, so you'll kind of hook me in there, too. Exactly, and you know, uh, the indication is in the Gospels that the, the siblings of Jesus, especially his brothers, did not get at first that he was who he said he was. Now, there's a scene where when he's up in Capernaum, Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers go to bring him home because they think he's acting crazy. 
And that's when they say your brother, your mother and brothers are outside. And he says, who, who, who is my mother? Or who are your mother? Who is your mother? Who are your brothers? You know. And he talks about the fact that those who believe, those who are in the faith, that's his family. And it isn't until later. The indication is that one of the very first people that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection was James. Well, that would shake one up. You watched your brother die on a cross and be buried, and a short time later he shows up. And remember, Jesus was doing things like, even though he was he was in a resurrected body, he was in a corporeal body because he ate fish with them. You know, he told Thomas, touch the hole in my hand and the hole in my side. Um, so he had a physical body, but he still had, he had miraculous abilities. You know, they're in, in a room with the door locked and Jesus appears in their midst. So even though he had a corporeal body, he was able to do miraculous things. So, you know, James, like the others, may have been, you know, he thought, oh, my brother's been killed by the, by the Romans. They may come for us next. He may have been locked in a room. I'm making this up now, but you get the picture. He may have been locked in a room for the same reasons that Peter and the others were locked in a room in Acts 2, because they were fearful of the authorities. And all of a sudden, his brother Jesus shows up through a locked door and says, by the way, James, I'm not really dead, and I am who I told you I am very son of God. And James goes, I believe. Again, we don't have that story, but apparently something like that happened because the next thing we know, James is one of the top leaders in the church and other members of his family, Jude and probably others, also had come to believe that this, you know, this brother of theirs, this half-brother of theirs, uh, truly was the son of God. Also something for the Gnostics to explain the way why he was able to be touched and why he was cooking and eating and so on and so forth. He doesn't have a real body. Exactly. Yeah, the Gnostics wouldn't have gotten that. So. Okay. Thank you all very much.